Greg, uh, Greg Horowitz have, has for several years been looking at the question of ecosystems. Um, he was one of the lead designers in um, San Diego. Um, while the Silicon Valley grew organically, San Diego grew with a bit more of human intention. <laughs> and so being able to see how an ecosystem can be well developed becomes very, very key. Um, Greg has been um, working with several governments in probably how many countries now? Totally, yeah, in 23 countries. Okay, in 23 countries, trying to help them map out their ecosystem. And when he leaves here today, he's going to Moscow to um, um, help with um, some of the ecosystem development. Um, I think with the canvas, you will begin to get the sense of his thinking about part of what helps to distinguish him is the varied career in the venture industry, from man managing his own company to being able to become an investor and now working with a lot of governments in terms of designing ecosystems. So just a wide range of experiences. He's also a member of the Kaufman and Society of Kaufman Fellows, which is a network of um, over 300 uh, venture capitalists in over 39 countries. Um, Kochiro, who has also spoke yesterday, um, has been looking at cross-border investment. And I know several of you have been involved in innovation and have been involved in investment, financiers, and have been involved in government. So really, all along, um, amongst us here, we are all bringing something to contribute to the ecosystem development. Our goal is to enable um, Ahmedabad to surpass the Silicon Valley in terms of um, capital formation. Um, by having that goal, we're not trying to replicate the Silicon Valley, we're trying to exceed the Silicon Valley. So when we have a benchmark, then we can see how we can get above that. And part of that reason is that um, in India, India is projected to have the highest human capital in the world in about um, 20 years time. And in the knowledge economy, that's what keeps the advantage. So yesterday we dealt on some of the issues that have to be addressed, like the mindset and belief. But once these things are moved out of the way, then it's human capacity that wins the race. So saying that we want um, Ahmedabad to surpass Silicon Valley, theoretically is not a, an impossible goal. Uh, because when human begin to matter in terms of ecosystem development, then it's really what can we do to enable that formation to happen. So I would like to welcome Greg and um, kick off the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So hopefully the sound in here, you'll be able to hear my voice and it will not be too bouncy. Um, those of you who have heard me talk the last uh, couple of days, I'm going to tell you a slightly different story, um, which is about what we did in San Diego, which led to this, because that was kind of the root of creating the rainforest. San Diego, for many years, was a town that's primary trading industries were defense, tourism, and real estate. And uh, our university, the University of California, San Diego, is a relatively young university. It's about 60 years old. Uh, so by global standards, uh, we're relatively young. And what was different about what the leaders decided to start the new university in San Diego, they decided to follow a different model. Traditionally, most research universities would start by getting all the really big names, I mean, getting all the bright young students to come and try to make it really attractive for all the smartest and brightest and youngest. What they decided to do is actually do what John Hopkins did, which is try to go for all the Nobel laureates. And when I studied at ECSD, which was my school, uh, I personally studied under seven Nobel laureates during my time there. Um, and so it was a wonderful experience. And it was in the 1980s, there was a uh, crisis. Uh, the city of San Diego lost the, uh, two very large microelectronics consortia to Austin, Texas. And it required uh, the construction of public private partnerships. <coughs> so the triple helix. Industry, government, academia had to come together to put these proposals together. And it was apparent that our groups had never even spoken to one another. Um, 
And so the, uh, the head of our economic development organization went and talked to our chancellor of our university and said, one, this is very embarrassing. Two, if we want to build a knowledge economy and a knowledge cluster, we're going to have to do things differently. So what is it exactly that we have to do? And we had a series of very fortunate accidents. We call them happy accidents. One is that our chancellor was brand new. And our chancellor happened to have just come from running the National Science Foundation. And before that, he was 17 years at Stanford University, where he worked closely with Fred Turman. And he said, well, it's pretty simple. In places like the Silicon Valley and in Boston, industry and academia have these natural conversations. And you have to understand that the kind of origins of what we call the Silicon Valley were in the areas of defense, that government was funding this high risk research that was potentially helpful to the government, but they were also the customers for the products that came out the back end. And so there was this natural dependency that they had on one another is that industry needed academics to help them solve these problems. Academics needed the funding from uh, these industrial sources to help uh, advance their research. And this is very much applied research. So this was the beginning, and then we realized what did we have to do in order to make this work? And so they started the program that I eventually ran called Connect. And really what it was, it was to bring all of these people together in the same room to begin having a conversation. And we started with programs like Meet the Researcher and Meet the Entrepreneur, where we just had these people come in and brought people from the community together, and these academics and these entrepreneurs began talking. And immediately we saw our first problem, that these researchers would talk about the elegance of the science without any direct understanding of really how you turn this into a business or why it would be meaningful for society, or how it could be meaningful for society. The academics were frustrated because they felt that the business people didn't quite understand the global impact of what this innovation represented. That potentially this could disrupt the world and this was not about building a Starbucks coffee down the street. So they realized that there needed to be not only an honest, neutral road, but something to help translate these various worlds uh, to, uh, to come into play. And it was this program that we created to be the honest, neutral facilitator of these conversations. And that is really kind of how we learned and how it led pretty much uh, to the rainforest. And today, even the program in San Diego has, uh, has launched over 2,000 companies. They just surpassed a billion dollars in financing, uh, in first round financing. And their market capitalization has approached 25 million. Uh, so, it's been enough of uh, an impact that Michael Porter, who was the one who coined the term technology clusters, when he was doing his famous reports from Harvard University, he did a case study in San Diego, and he said, this program is very interesting because it is a purpose-driven, purpose-built activity, whereas the Silicon Valley and Boston were far more organic models of how they grew. So this is kind of what we learned from actually uh, not only doing this stuff, but probably what is more important are our own mistakes Way. Uh, and we made lots of them. So we're going to introduce some of the concepts of, uh, um, of the canvas, and we're going to jump uh, relatively quick into this stuff. But I always think it's really good to kind of not only align definitions, but kind of figure out um, why we're really here and talk about that, just so we're kind of all on the same page about what we're going to accomplish. Because again, I don't know what was explained to you about what this workshop might or might not. Um, we have, when we work with groups, we have a very definitive path in terms of we work with people. But it's, it's interesting because the first thing is, it starts with emotion. It doesn't start with our client. It doesn't start with, you know, let's just jump in. It says, what do we really want out of this? What's, what's going to make us feel good? And what's, uh, what's our hope and our desires and our dreams? Why are we here? Then what you do is that you can begin creating definitions. And what's really interesting is we can sit down with groups use the term innovation, and I could probably ask each of you to write down a definition of the word innovation, and I suspect that we would have some radically different answers in terms of what we're talking about. So sometimes what we'll find is that language actually gets in our way. We think it's our friend, because we think it helps to create clarity, and it helps to communicate an idea or a vision, but sometimes it actually creates some of the greatest disconnects we 
at. And we see this all the time, even with our entrepreneurs. We will draw a line on a piece of paper and we're saying, here's an invention, here's a market. Where do you think as an entrepreneur you exist on this continuum? And entrepreneurs and the inventors will often say, we think we're here pretty close to the market. We just build a prototype, get it in the hands of the customers, and begin selling. We think we'll be fine. And of course, investors come in and say, well, we think you're here. So initially, that's why you have an uh, uh, immediate disconnect. And yet, we're all using the same language. We all have the same intent. Our intents are all good, but there's a disconnect. So we think it's really important to create this alignment. And then we actually do visualization exercise in terms of what does the future look like. And when we do the canvas today, we're going to do it twice. The first time is we're going to see how Ahmedabad and the region looks today. And we're going to answer them. A, a lens that says, if we look out our windows today and we talk to the people in the community today, what would they say and what would we observe? The second time we do it is we are going to time travel five years into the future. And we're going to be traveling and looking back and saying, where have we come from? What did we have to go through to get here? And how did we truly meet our goals or our desires? Uh, Diagnostics are very, very important. Audience really help us think through this. When you go into a doctor's office and you have some kind of an ailment where you want to know something about yourself, the diagnosis actually encompasses two different things. One is the physician is going to use his judgment, his pattern recognition, to ask you a set of questions and based on the answers, be able to tell something about you. But he's going to probably also run some kind of test, even if it's just taking your blood pressure, listening to your heart and lung, or you may run some blood tests. So it's the combination of these diagnostics that are really, really important. It's the qualitative and the quantitative. And one of the key goals I want you to be able to walk out of here today is not having all the answers, but to know how to ask the right questions to get the right answers. Because if you can do that, it's far more sustainable and scalable. So again, the mantra for today is learning how to uh, question, learn how to be reasoning and, and think laterally. Then once we do this, and we're not going to get to the second, uh, the second part today, which is how do we begin designing what our future looks like? Yes, we're going to do a canvas, but because of the time constraints, we're only going to really be able to start the whole process and we hope you will take it forward. Uh, but when you design, it's, a, it's, a, it's an iterative process, it's an organic process, it's going to continue on. And then once we design, we're going to build, and then once we build, we can measure and then iterate. And it's not just enough to iterate internally, but there's a much greater goal to all of what you're going to do. We'll talk a little bit about this because you will have a call to action. And that is, how are we then going to take what we have learned and apply it at a grander scale? Because really, as we discussed in the talks the last couple of days, an ecosystem is about creating a belief system. And so the fundamental question is, how do you create culture at scale? We feel pretty confident we can change the culture of the people in this room if we spend enough time together. First of all, all of you have been self-selected. You came here out of a decision and a choice to be here. And so somehow you either align with the ideas that we talk about, or you see a greater vision for what can be, or because uh, profitable made you come here. One of the above. But the fact is that once you're here, you then need to become apostles for this vision. And you need to be able to take these messages out to the community and inspire um, and educate others. And so this will provide a tool. So these are some of our great innovators uh, from the U.S. Uh, do do any of you know who these people are? I think some of you already saw this. So, um, of course, we have Henry Ford. Over here, we have Thomas Edison. Uh, this gentleman is the president, uh, Warren G. Hardy, or was the president at the time. And this gentleman is Harvey Firestone, uh, the man who figured out how to vulcanize rubber uh, for tires. So some of our great innovators. So innovation and you know visionaries are certainly not.